So thank you. This has been a great day so far. I'm really enjoying all the talks. Um, next, we're going to turn to the innovation keynote. Uh, so last semester in Ned Reimer's Health Sector um, Issues and Opportunities course, we read The Doctor Will EC You Now, a Harvard Business Case Review on American Well. Um, and that was the day Deepak and I realized that we had to get you here uh, to talk about this at the Health and Life Sciences Conference. Uh, so today, Dr. Schoenberg is going to discuss the implications and challenges of telehealth. Um, healthcare reform has introduced drastic changes to the landscape of medicine, and telehealth stands out as one of the most intriguing and exciting trends in both America and across the globe. American Well is the nation's largest telehealth operator and brings quality healthcare into the homes and workplaces of patients. Dr. Ida Schoenberg serves as the chairman and CEO of American Well Corporation and oversees the company's corporate strategy. An MD from the Sackler School of Medicine, Ida has a lengthy track record of successfully leading tech companies in healthcare. Dr. Schoenberg also co-founded IMD Soft and served as the CEO of CareKey Incorporated in the past. Without further delay, Dr. Ida Schoenberg. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, there are many students here, which is great. To be honest, the main reason that we're in Boston is because of you. As the company grows, we have terrific talent that is coming and joining our little revolution here that we started about nine years ago. And we don't have a lot of time today, so what I'd like to do is tell you our story, which is in some ways the story of telehealth and the way that we try to improve on, on healthcare in general. So uh, if you think about it, in the future, we believe that care will go to where we are and not to where patients, well, hospitals are, are built. So Mass General is a wonderful institution, as Peter Slavin is a dear friend. But when you go to a hospital, we pay for whatever the hospital decided to build and we believe that technology will allow us, when it's all said and done, to age more gracefully in our homes, spending time with family and friends, uh, and only using territory centers when it's absolutely uh, necessary. Um, in primary care, we are quite certain that five years from now, every single person in America, when you have a sore throat or a cough, you'll grab your iPad or something similar, and you go to bed and you talk to a doctor and you'll send someone to pick up a medication or even the medication will come to your home uh, quite uh, quickly. However, primary care is just the beginning of what telehealth could be and not a very important part of what it could be. The holy grail is, of course, to take care of chronically ill patients in their homes and do something that is uh, much more meaningful. So in essence, in order to do that, it takes a village. So the most important participants are always the patient, but also the doctor and other providers. That's the core of the relationship. But employers, payers, governments, state and federal, retail pharmacies and even pharmacos are all very important. And you are not able to provide something that sticks unless you cater to everybody's vantage point and interests. So when we started American Well, we started to focus on health plans because they had members and they could pay the bill, and they had doctors' networks, at least in theory. And today, our health plan clients, partners, cover 107 million lives. That's a good chunk of uh, the uh, market right there. And they include 29 Blue Cross and Blue Shield plans, including Blue Cross Blue Shield of Massachusetts, uh, here in our home state. Uh, we also work with employers. We have today more than 1,000 companies you would recognize all the names, including Google, Apple, Oracle, American Express, JetBlue, Whole Foods, One, Metronic, and many others. Um, and we've discovered that they are a great way to increase employee awareness. When the head of HR turns to the employees and says, hey, we have a new benefit, that's a very inexpensive way to make them aware uh, of our offering. We also have a DTC platform, an ability to download an app in iOS and in Android. And according to App and it's, it's fairly popular. Uh, but lastly, and very importantly, we began to sell our platform to providers, hospitals and hospital networks. And that's really important for a number of reasons. 
first and foremost, the people that I trust the most are the doctors in my community. No company will be able to compete with that level of trust. For something simple, maybe I'll talk to a doctor in the, in the cloud, but if my child is really sick or if I'm really worried, I will go to Mass General or to Children or to BID uh, or in Cleveland to Cleveland Clinic. Number two, the type of services that you can offer when you work with hospitals and delivery networks is dramatically more broad than what you could do with doctors in the box in the cloud. In addition to that, there is a big move in healthcare today, which is called the move from fee-for-service to fee-for-value. Doctors are assuming risks. So health plans turn to them and say, hey, if you're going to spend $10 million next year based on our actuary forecast, and you're going to give great service for $8 million, we're going to cut a check of $1 million and give it to you. So the entire view of providers on how to manage their relationship with patients has changed, and that created a very viable business structure to the need of providers to be much more in contact with the populations uh, that they serve. Lastly, right now, less than 1% of the people in America are using telehealth. It's almost embryonic, despite the hype and the talk. But according to the most conservative analyst, 20% of the U.S. population is going to use telehealth within three years. And some venture to say that it's 50 or 60 percent. No company will be able to hire enough doctors to moonlight and do that. The only way to actually make this work is to rely on the existing infrastructure of care. So when you look at American Well, we have about $200 million of technology that does a lot of things. But we also focus on what does it really take to license, enroll, train, a provider, a doctor or a nurse or a specialist to be effective online and also to provide an effective service with very short wait times that is highly integrated with the main pathway of care. Lastly, we also spend a lot of time in understanding what does it take to engage consumers and providers. We realized a few years ago that we had no idea how to do that. And to our horror, it turns out that our clients were not much better, whether it's hospitals or health plans or employers. Engaging consumer digitally is just a different domain. So we took a guy that was actually working in this town in Boston, uh, and the company he basically was, was, was working for is, is TripAdvisor. And he created digital marketing for TripAdvisor, and before that to Hulala and Kayak. His name is Mike Putnam. And we brought them we brought him into American Well and we said, can you help us? As a result of his effort, our traffic grew fairly dramatically. And in the same way, our customer acquisition cost went down from as high as $450 to less than $10 within a year. So that was a great example of recognizing the fact that you have serious vulnerability and bringing people from a discipline that is truly foreign to make an impact. So, the idea behind American Well is a really simple idea. It's telemedicine on steroids a little bit. Telemedicine is connecting one point of care to another, overcoming distance. What we said is that we're going to create a brokerage platform, but instead of connecting one point of care to another, we're going to take two clouds, a cloud of patients and a cloud of doctors. And we are going to use business rules and clinical rules to create the best match between supply and demand. And as a result, we can offer people, consumers, much greater choice at a much lower cost, at much better price and great convenience from wherever they are. At the same time, we can allow providers to sell their time regardless of where they are, overcoming efficiencies. Now, despite the attractiveness of this idea that we patented about nine years ago, it turns out that it's really, really hard to do. Some problems include licensure. Is the doctor licensed to treat me? What do I need to pay? Is my health plan participating? Do I need to pay out of pocket? Is this doctor allowed to prescribe this type of medication based on rules, regulations, and the financial product I'm on, and many, many other challenges? So we took many years, and every box that you see on this slide here requires three hours of discussion. The easiest thing in the world is to Skype and talk to a patient. 
the actual con connection with video conferencing is, is really a no-brainer. But when you want to make it integral part of the health system, there are tons of issues that emerge. So some of the things that we do is are focused on making it a meaningful encounter. For example, we make sure that we allow patients to choose their doctor. That may sound obvious to you. None of our competitors do that, and it's actually quite hard to do. So when you log in, based on different criteria, you can say who's the right doctor for you. And when the doctor is talking to you, we make sure that there is as much information as possible to make it an informed encounter. And the summary of this visit should flow back into your EMR. One of the great risks of telehealth is to increase fragmentation in care, to create yet another convenient care outlet that will compete with good care. What we're trying to do is prevent that and make sure that it is just another tool in the arsenal of doctors to provide the care that we know and trust. Uh, at the same time, despite the use complexity, we wanted to make sure that the experience is delightful. And it's delightful not only for consumers, it's really important that it's going to be simple, integrated, and attractive to providers. We look at doctors as our audience just as much as we look at consumers because the key to adoption is very much in their hands, in our opinion. So we spend enormous amount of effort making sure that the whole process of credentialing, training, monitor what, monitoring what they do is as a, a deep and as effective as a, we can. And today we offer service in 46 states around the clock with an average wait time of three minutes. The average wait time to see a doctor in America is 19 days. So that's somewhat of an improvement of what you see today in primary care. Uh, mobile, like many others, change our lives. It took us many years, and we only launched our mobile platform last year in 14. And the numbers were fairly dramatic from that point on. There is some magic in the simple interface in my ability to take an iPhone out and know that when, within three minutes, I'm going to talk to a board-certified credential physician that I'm able to uh, choose. So as you can see, uh, when we launched mobile, the little chart there demonstrates the growth of the use of our platform, it was fairly, fairly good. And we got a lot of rewards, and we got the most uh, popular medical app from Apple and iOS. Tim Cook actually bought us the watch before everybody else were able to get it. We launched a lot of ancillary products, like kiosks. For the record, I was against that. But, you know, I'm not alone in the company, so they voted me out. Uh, and the reason I said I don't think that's good because when I'm sick, I don't want to go to a kiosk and report my issues in a workplace. But as it turns out, we sell a lot of those, and there is a lot of eff effect or impact on putting them in community centers, in retail pharmacies, uh, in employers, cafeterias, and so on and so forth. We did that when wearables were not so prevalent. So the biggest impact of kiosk was the ability to take an otoscope and put it in a child's ear and project it in high definition to an ENT specialist that is far away, or take an electronic stethoscope and put it on someone's chest. That today is much improved by the sharp decrease in cost and complexity of devices that we can actually use uh, at the home. So doing it well does not only require technology, it requires a very long list of practices to actually make people aware of the platform, and much more importantly, trust it. And you can try it at home. Go to your parents and say, would you like to talk to a doctor from iPad? It's not an obvious thing. If I need to choose one thing that was hard, that is the thing, to make sure, to, to try to make people do something that they didn't do uh, before. Uh, but the good news is that the financial metrics are pretty awesome. So we're able to prove that when the people do use it, in 85% of the cases, we replace ER visits and office visits. Uh, so we create very significant medical savings. That each visit is saving between one hour to three hours of work time. So there are very big productivity savings. And people love that, which can be translated to employee retention uh, and attraction. And as a result, many of our payer clients began to offer it as a covered benefit, which made the price go from $49 to $20, $10, sometimes 5 or 0 
And of course, that was a very big push to the adoption of uh, the platform. So we, we wrote a lot of bonus checks in 14. When everything came together, when it was a covered benefit, when it was simple, when it was mobile, when we had very short wait time and a great service, everything showed up fairly dramatically. And then we, we basically looked at the mirror and said, so who did we become? And we realized that we've become the champions of the ZPAC, the Dutch of the sore throat and the Earl of the stomachache. Now, while that is quite nice, this is not why we started American Well. We wanted to do something that has much more impact. So while this way of describing it is, is a little light, but a few years before, we began to do something else that was ripe and ready last year to be unveiled that is really a very different strategy. So what we did until now, the low-hanging fruit of primary care, short wait time, was what we call Telehealth 1.0, the starting point, the beginning of the runway. What we now focus on is what we call Telehealth 2.0. And Telehealth 2.0 is instead of trying to hire doctors in the cloud that will talk with you, we're trying to collect doctors that you trust in your neighborhood to use telehealth as one of their means of communication. Now, while that may sound obvious, there are huge hurdles of integration, connectivity, use, uh, and deployment that are driven from that type of a task. So what, do, what are we trying to do right now? We want to focus on the chronically ill patient in her, her home. And we work with Apple that is now spending billions on devices that are on the phone, on our bodies, in the house. So instead of having one data point, we have millions of signals that are going into the cloud. And then companies like Optum and IBM are doing big data analytics to understand what happened and decide what to do. And we make this information available to risk-bearing providers that can say, hey, the fact that the grandmother weigh herself every day in the bathroom and gain the pound a day may be related to her heart. And then the doctor can proactively reach out to the patient and say, I'm going to change your diuretics. And what we'd like to do is not only allow the doctor to prescribe a new medication, but actually have someone knock on her door and say, here it is. And oh, by the way, it's much cheaper than the medication that you received in CVS last week. So we announced this year that we are partnering with Teva. Teva is the largest generic manufacturer in the world. People know that they are very big. People missed often the fact that they now offer more than 80% of the care continuum, which is pretty amazing. In 80% of the cases, they have a medication for you. So that last mile will allow for medications to be potentially, in the future, delivered to your home with a lot of information whether you need to take it while you're pregnant, whether you need to take it with food and things of that nature. And the end result is that the consumers will have much better choice, much lower cost, uh, but still have great care. So we have today about 800 doctors that are part of what we call the online care group. And that's the tip of the pyramid of our service. Those doctors are doing the sore throat, the stomach ache, the simple things. What we really like to do is, when it's all said and done, replace them with the backbone of America, with hospitals and practices and doctors that are already practicing, and to make them available to anyone that could shop for their services uh, online. So in order to do that, we spend enormous energy on non-sexy stuff, stuff that you don't really see, like deep integration into Epic and other EMRs. Um, we also connect to more and more devices in the home and elsewhere to create meaningful uh, encounter. And we spend most of our energy not on consumers. We spend most of our energy on providers. So for example, we unveil this year an app for the doctor to manage their entire relationship with their patients from their phone or their tablet. It does many, many things beyond the time that we have today, but for example, it allows the doctor to send an invitation for a patient who never heard about American Well, just through email, and say, I'd like to talk to you. The only thing the doctor, the patient needs to do is just press a blue button and everything magically happens so they see the smiling face of the doctor in high definition within a few minutes. 
This is, this is one of the simplest thing to explain and one of the most complicated things we've ever done. Because there are HIPAA, security, payment issues, there's lots of issues in order to create this experience. But once you do that, it's pretty powerful. We also created a new availability type for doctors. Because at the beginning, we forced doctors to sit near a table and you know, be available for, for patients. What we did this year is say, we have a new availability task that we call Ask Me, which is very much like Uber. So if I'm a mother in Boston, and I want to talk to any pediatrician that works in Mass General, we are paging all of them, and the first one that could be available is raising their hand and say, I can do that right now. We still ask the patient to say yes, because we think the patient should say yes or no about the doctor, but if both parties want to talk to each other, we go ahead and connect them. That liberated providers completely from the need to be on call or to be waiting for a call. We left it to their choice whether they want to make the service available or not. And as a result, we got many more doctors that are part of our network. Now, the fact that we moved to mobile and created a provider app did one other thing that was really helpful. We don't anymore know where patients are. We also know where doctors are. And with that, we can do a lot of things. So for example, um, I'm sure you've been in rounds in hospitals. So there is a patient, lots of doctor around the bed. And then you look for the infection guy or the neurologist, and you can never find them. So what we've done is we used the Uber capability. We reached out to all the neurologists in the service. And the first one that is available can show up at the point of care on a stick and participate in the same visit. This is harder than it sounds, because there is a lot of matchmaking and scheduling uh, availability that we had to uh, make available. But in essence, what we've done is we changed the definition of the point of care for patients, but also for uh, providers. This year, Cleveland Clinic is going to open a boutique store in Live Health Online of Anthem. Anthem, Anthem serves 38.5 million people. Cleveland Clinic normally serves the driving distance around their hospitals, and some people fly to see them. Now, so many people will be able to benefit from the quality of services they, they can provide, and more choice and more availability will be able to be available even in places that normally could never afford it. So, what really happened was that for eight years we were really innovating, thinking about what we want to do and creating the platform. What happened in the last couple of years is that, that innovation moved from our platform into our client's platform. And every day now, our clients come to us and say, hey, I'm going to do a virtual emergency room. I find a way to take care of someone that has an end-stage renal kidney uh, at home and manage their care through the platform. And, and that's an amazing thing to see. When you enable communication, the different parties that normally were competing and not connected to each other are beginning to find ways to create collaboration. Imagine mini clinic care at CVS as a remote point of care for population management that is done by Cleveland Clinic, uh, for example. So many of the things that I mentioned are truly unique to American Well. Uh, it took a long time to, to develop. Uh, but now they offer a real opportunity for anyone that wants to innovate and change the way that we all get care uh, to go ahead and uh, take advantage of that. So people talk a lot about telehealth. And I think that the telehealth world will not be here in five years from now. There's no telelawyer, right? I call my lawyer. It's not a big deal. I use the phone because it's convenient. People are going to connect to the healthcare platform electronically and will be part of the way that we normally uh, interact, which is really a good thing. So it took a long, long time and a long walk in the desert to get here, but we are pretty excited about where telehealth is going and the impact it can have on the lives of all of us. Happy to answer questions. Sure. So as I mentioned, we have four verticals. 
We work with health plans, employers, consumers, and providers. With the exception of consumers, all the others are paying us service fees. So when Live Health Online of Anthem is using the service to be available to employers, they pay us an annual fee. In addition to that, we get a margin between the cost, the reimbursed cost of the visit and the cost of the doctor. So for example, for a visit in primary care, we get $49, but we pay doctors typically about $32. So we get a fee by the drink and we get a service fee. The same is true for employers and the same is true for uh, providers. Uh, currently, most of our revenue is service-based, like the rest of the players in the industry, but we see a very clear trend where bigger and bigger percentage of it is generated from the margin of the visits. We also are now moving away from primary care. Last year, we introduced nutrition. Uh, in January, we're going to announce a network of behavioral health in uh, psychology and psychiatry. And down the road, we want to see more and more specialty care that is going to be reimbursed. Regarding reimbursement, when we started, nobody was ready to pay for it, literally no one. Uh, right now, uh, we started the year with about 7 million people that have us as a covered benefit. Um, in 1-1 one -one of next year, 1-1-16, 47 million people are going to get it as a benefit. So for example, United Health Care, which is part of United Health Group, offered it to 300,000 people in the state of Nevada as an experiment. The experiment went really, really well, and in 1116, they're going to edit a little bit and use, give it for a little bit more people, and that will be 15 million people. So we see a really big jump in consensus where there is growing body of evidence to show that the return on investment of those type of visits is, is there. Hi, I'm Heidi Alward, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Massachusetts. I am interested um, also in the payer aspect, and my question is um, integration with health plans. So in cases where this is a covered benefit, um, does the technology allow uh, for administrative efficiency with the provider in order to be able to bill the health plan and for the patient to be able to pay what would be expected for their out-of-pocket expense? First of all, thank you for your business. <laughs> uh, we are proud to have you as a client uh, and a part of the Blue family. The answer is absolutely yes. So the reason it took so long and hundreds of millions of dollars is the deep integration that is not only clinical but also financial. So when someone has it as a benefit, when you log in, we identify you as a member and then we check your eligibility in real time against the health plan system and you only pay your co-payment or whatever is part of your product. Then we collect this co-payment, we submit a claim, we pay the doctor, we pay ourselves, uh, and basically the entire thing is integrated in the experience. Providers that work on our platform do not need to work in parallel with their existing uh, uh, claim uh, system. Hi, Joe Camillus from Boston Medical Center. First, thank you for the presentation. I thought it was excellent. Um, it, it seems to me that version 1.0 of American Well was, it seems a little bit like a disintermediation strategy for our hospitals and, and providers. Whereas version 2.0 sounds like it's more of a partnership model where you are looking for capitated institutions like, like BMC or, or MGH and working with hospitals to manage uh, care at a population health level. So if, if I'm right, can you explain a little bit more what your value proposition is to hospitals? Are you supplying the technology and we supply the interventions, or are you giving us the interventions plus the technology and giving us a demonstrated ROI against our, our capitated rate? Sure. So when we started many years ago, we always felt that what we'd like to do is to connect hospitals like Boston Medical Center with your own patients and maybe with other patients that are not lucky enough to get to see you. But we stood there and we saw a really long runway and we had to finance our growth. So what we could sell was simple service to employers and to health plans to say primary care, really simple. We didn't really have an agenda to increase fragmentation but we had to do that first to show that people actually get care online because at the time people were not sure about that as well. However, the core of our strategy today 
is to do what you just described. So for example, Jefferson in Philadelphia uh, has 19 different use cases using our platform. So put it in a simple way, they have an app, and they have a website, and they have a telephone service. Although we try not to do telephone as much as we can, we believe that video is really, really important. And under this app, you have different storefronts, different services. The examples include virtual emergency room. 85% of the people that go to ER don't need to be there. So what you can do if you live in Philadelphia is download the app. You don't really trust companies, but you do trust Jefferson. So you go and you talk to Jeff's providers, and they help you decide whether you need to come in or not. And if you don't, maybe they can send you a script uh, that you can take to take care of whatever you have. If you do come into the hospital, we can put a kiosk in the hospital. And now you can turn left to wait a few hours to see someone really, really tired. Or you can turn right in the kiosk, talk to doctors that are part of the Jefferson brand that you still trust, and get your business done within a few minutes. Uh, I mentioned earlier this idea of load balancing inside the hospital. One of our clients is community health systems. They have over 200 hospitals. Some of them are less busy than others. Imagine the fact that now they can basically co-cover each other online and offer a lot of access, not only to provide service directly to consumers, but also sometimes to consult between each other. One specialist to a PCP, another specialist to, to another, multidisciplinary teams. When someone is discharged from the hospital, let's say that I had an open heart surgery, and I go home and I drink two cups of coffee and I have palpitations. And the first thing I do is I run back to the emergency room because I'm pretty confident that I'm about to die. But if I have an app that says Boston Medical Center and I can talk to the team that I trust, not to be confused with someone that I never met online that has access to my record, they may let me know that my palpitations are perfectly normal and everything is okay and I can stay uh, at home. These are some examples. There are many more examples. Uh, the basic idea is that this is a capability. It's a platform. Um, really, if you crystallize what it is, it's a communication platform that is safe, secure, financially available, practical for normal players in the ecosystem to interact with one another. Um, I'd like to follow up on your platform comment, and I'd like you to speak a little bit about the challenges of doing this type of complex service development. iOS, Android, Windows Phone, Windows 10. Obviously, you can't necessarily have a single app. Even offering Jefferson involves, just with those examples, five. How complex can it get and still be viable? I wish I knew the answer to that. Um, we are very religious about one code base. So there is one platform. And one platform is not only because it's easier to support uh, and manage, it also means that every client that we have can interact with another client. So if I'm a doctor in Cleveland Clinic, I can actually sell services to Oracle or to Capital Blue Cross if that's something that makes sense. Uh, it's unbelievably complicated. It's really, really hard. Uh, but there is a way to do that. Uh, Oracle is doing the same. Google is doing the same. When you build from the ground up in a, a platform that is supposed to be in the cloud, serving many, many constituents, to scale to tens or hundreds of millions of people, uh, and you build it the right way, it's possible. Uh, but of course, the details are well beyond the scope of this type of uh, uh, dialogue. But you're right to point out the complexity and the challenges in that. Um, first, thanks for coming. This is a really interesting technology. Um, Quick question, you mentioned the, the sort of cost savings that you get, and it absolutely makes sense from, I guess, a scale economy's perspective. But you also briefly mentioned sort of the shift from fee-for-service to fee-for-value. Have you looked at or done any sort of analysis in terms of what sort of value this technology provides relative to actually going into a doctor and seeing the actual inpatient? Um, and is there any difference between readmission rates or seeing a second, you know, getting a, getting a second opinion or using the technology and maybe the patient didn't get the result that they were looking for, so then they ended up going to the actual doctor. Yes, so um, as I mentioned earlier, in primary care, we and many other third parties proved and got to pretty much the same result 
that in 85% of the cases, we solve the patient's problem, which means that they would go otherwise to a more expensive setting, and this driving very significant medical saving. So that allowed us to, to survive. Um, the jury is out about the exact value of things that are much more material, of keeping a chronic patient uh, in the home. Uh, but there is a consensus that it's extremely valuable. Of course, it can be abused. Uh, if you're talking to the wrong guy that is uninformed, uh, overreaching uh, what they do and do more than, than the medium should, should offer, uh, then it's, it's, it's not the right a, a solution. Uh, I think there is a, a clarity right now that there are a lot of efficiencies. People are going to finance it, um, and it's going to be meaningful. Uh, but beyond money, uh, it's also going to be very helpful. Uh, because the hardships on the consumer today, and all of us, not the young people, but the older people, uh, are clients of this healthcare system, and it's very unpleasant and very dangerous, uh, not only very uh, expensive. So what we're trying to do is actually uh, think also about the qualitative uh, value, not only uh, the financial uh, value uh, that we, we, we provide. I hope that, that answers your question. Um, we are seeing more and more use cases. Um, you would need to help me out on the dental part. I need to imagine it, but there may be something that can be done. Uh, we are, as a platform provider, open to any type of uh, uh, initiative, if you will, if it makes sense. It's very, very important to define a very clear business case, uh, which is not abstract, that is very, very uh, uh, practical. I think that primary care, nutrition, because you want to remember us when you're not sick, behavioral health, because it makes so much sense to do that online and you don't need hands in order to do that, and then different type of high dependency chronic illness is the path that we are taking, but we would love to have a dialogue about other disciplines as well. And by the way, American Way is a client of your company as, as employees. We're very happy. So I'll answer with a story. Uh, when we started the platform, we looked to our first client, and nobody was really ready to buy it. So the only one that says yes was Blue Cross Blue Shield of Hawaii. And it was winter here in Boston, so it made sense to go and visit them and try to sell the platform. <laughs> uh, so we went there, uh, and I went in front of the medical board, and it's like a court. They sit really high up. And the chairman pointed at me and said, how dare you suggest that you're going to prescribe things like controlled substances to patients without physically examining them and, and introducing them. And it didn't really work. So we went to the governor of Hawaii, Linda Linger, and we said, look, it's fantastic here. We really enjoyed our time, but the medical board doesn't allow us to operate, so we 